as of 1983, I had completed all my coursework for my PhD at the University of Chicago. But 1983, people tend to forget this, was a horrible year. It was the worst recession after the Great Depression. Um, so if you Google 1983, you'll find out that that was a horrible year for people coming onto the job market. So um, I thought, after I completed my coursework, I need to have a backup plan because it doesn't look necessarily as though I'm going to get a job in academics. And people I knew who were getting jobs were getting them in very out-of-the-way places where I didn't think it would be very viable for my husband and I to both find work. So I applied for and got into the first scholar program at First National Bank of Chicago. And this was a um, management training program where the... Um, First Scholar would rotate through all the different departments of the bank and get expertise while having the bank pay for an MBA. So for the next period of five to six years, I worked at First Chicago, which is now J.P. Morgan here in Chicago, got my MBA in finance and got expertise in trading floor activities, lending activities, operational products. So in around 1987-88, I decided that the job market was picking up a bit for philosophers and that if I were going to come back and complete my PhD, I ought to at least complete the PhD and make one more try to get a job in philosophy. So when I came back um, and then completed my PhD around 1990, when I went looking for a job, there were even more positions in applied ethics. And at this point, business ethics um, was a job I was eminently well qualified for because I had an MBA in finance, a degree in philosophy, a degree in ethics. And, um, you know, the magic sort of happened. DePaul University took me on, and that's how I got my first job in applied ethics. But it wasn't really as though I were fixated on business ethics from the beginning. It's just that that's where the job opportunities opened up. Um, no, they weren't very explicit. The philosophy department was very glad to have somebody who could teach business ethics from a um, grounded philosophical perspective. So I def de definitely had good background in philosophy. But I think the, um, the low goal, or organizational goal if you want to put it that way, was that I would help out the university with its American accreditation of College of school and Schools and Business um, accreditation process because you needed to show that you were teaching ethics and there was increasing pressure to do that. So by offering a business ethics class, um, I could help with uh, that, um, that desire by the institution. I think at the higher end, um, the organization wanted me to uh, help with the formation of the human person. Um, so that was the higher goal. Well, I think initially, um, I wanted to have the students very grounded in the field of ethics. And I think over time I began to realize that since I was teaching a lot of business and commerce undergrads, that it would be better to focus the class um, on practical issues that had ethical dimensions. So I think my focus shifted, I wouldn't say exclusively to case studies, but I was more interested in getting students to think about um, what might be professional dimensions of business that they should be that they should be thinking about. And on the formation side, um, I think initially I wanted the students to um, think long and hard about their decision to go into business. And I think that there were some students I did get to um, think more about what issues they might encounter. But over time, I began to realize, well, let's, um, let's just rein in the expectation here a little bit and just help the students um, learn to identify some very common ethical issues they might get involved with, and then give them some really practical advice. I used to say that if the students learn nothing but this one thing, I would be happy, and that's that if they saw some kind of ethical problem and were inclined to be a so-called whistleblower, that they should get an attorney of their own. Because when I was at the bank, I remember one, having one of the lawyers say, well, you know, if you perceive any wrongdoing, you should come to us. We're your lawyer. And I thought about that for a bit. And having worked in professional ethics, I thought that cannot be right. Their client must be the bank. And indeed, when I said, but wait a second, isn't your client the bank? The head of the you know, internal law department sort of started backpedaling and saying, oh, you're right. You know, we're not really your lawyer. So I'd always tell the students if I teach the class, get your own lawyer if you think you're going to need one.
Well, I think that um, on the on the more theoretical side of business ethics, um, one of my accomplishments has been to really bring in non-rule-based ethics. So I was one of the first people, along with Ed Hartman, to start stretching, start stressing uh, virtue ethics. I introduced ideas of ethics of trust, ideas of professions, and whether or not business was the profession. Um, so I think that I really helped orient things away from um, duty-based ethics and rule-based ethics towards um, non-rule-based ethics, including things like feminist ethics. I believe I was one of the first people to ever do anything on the ethics of care at the Society for Business Ethics. And then I know I was the first person ever to do a presentation on Confucian ethics, which are also a form of virtue ethics. So I think that that's been a contribution. And I think another contribution has really been to open up additional areas of research, um, particularly on trust, um, the ethics of multi-level marketing. I wrote the first paper on that, and I saw recently that's being quoted now by the American Association of Retired People in a friend of the court brief for one of the appellate courts, federal appellate courts. So I feel like that was a real contribution to getting people to think more about brand new forms of business that are emerging. Um, I also did an early amount of, uh, early some early work along with a colleague, Dr. Joe Young, who was a finance person and who would do the quantitative work, we did a lot of work on corporate governance ratings and whether or not those were really correlated with um, better stock market performance, and in particular with rating agencies, um, um, uh, uh, ratings of companies, and then how likely the firms were to um, restate earnings due to fraud. And I saw with interest that the um, Federal Reserve used that paper in its deliberations about rating agencies, the ethics of rating agencies. So I think that I've made some contributions in opening up new areas of research in theory and in practice. Well, I would say, um, thinking back, that the initial ethical issues in the field had a lot to do with the status of corporations. So there were many, many articles on whether or not corporations were persons, whether or not a legal person really should be a person. So there was a lot of agitation around that. Um, that has somewhat subsided, but that was a question that was definitely in the air, and I remember hearing many presentations on that. And then another issue that was emerging was um, the, the relative merits of stockholder theory versus stakeholder theory. And stakeholder theory is so well established now, it's hard to remember that it was extremely controversial in the late eight, 1980s and in the early 1990s. So that was a big question at the time. Oh, I think we have a lot of issues that we're still facing. I think um, one of the issues that has not still really been well addressed is if corporations embrace stakeholder theory, what does that really mean to listen to the stakeholders? And if you're going to talk about balancing stakeholder issues, the question is, what's the fulcrum? You know, every there is no balance unless you have a fulcrum for a, a lever. So you need to identify what's that point, the central point around which the balancing is going to happen. And I don't think people have been analytically very astute yet about that. And even the question of, you know, um, how do you really consult with st stakeholders in a practical way? Um, we, could do, we could do a lot more work on, on the pragmatics of stakeholder theory, I think. No, I don't think doing applied ethics per se is a profession. You know, business might be a profession, but you know, a profession, in my understanding, is is a covenant. You know, the professionals historically were the clergy, the lawyers, and the doctors, and they all made a public oath. It was a professio, a public promise, which is not a contract. It was a one-way promise to present and potential future clients to come for the benefit of the client. So in the Hippocratic Oath, the would-be doctor swears to come for the benefit of the health of the client. And not just for the interest of the client, because you don't want doctors doing surgery just because a client happens to want it, a patient happens to want it. Um, but um, in the case of applied ethics, there is no covenant that we all make. There's not a uniform covenant that that you, Summer Brown, and that I, you know, Daryl Kane, have sworn to, or that Pat Warehane and Ed Hartman have done that. Maybe some of us could come together with some kind of covenant, but I don't think that kind of covenant 
exists. And I think also that the covenant gets triggered when a potential client comes into the presence of a professional. So that's why if you've ever been on a plane and someone gets sick and the pilot says, is there a doctor on board the plane? Usually um, a physician will stand up and even if the person's not been their patient in the past, they feel that their oath has been triggered, so to speak, by the presence of a sick person. I don't know that the presence of any would-be student would trigger my oath. I mean, I'm happy to teach students who've paid their tuition, but I'm not sure DePaul is going to be very happy if I put hold on a shingle and say, you know, any student can come tuition free and let me, you know, uh, teach them about ethics. And there's always, put it differently, there's always a pro bono aspect to every one of the professions. And is there really a pro bono aspect to, you know, doing applied ethics? I'm not, I'm not sure. So I, I think the case for doing applied ethics, treating applied ethics as a profession would need to be fleshed out a lot more before I would assent to it being such. Oh, I think a lot of the um, stakeholder versus stockholder debate has been resolved that, you know, many, many people now would say uh, that you have something like a version of stakeholder theory in charge, like even the conference board, many people on the conference board, many of the corporations and CEOs of the conference board would at least give lip service to stakeholder theory. I think some of the um, bottom of the pyramid issues are being resolved. The idea that corporations should pay attention to people who are suffering from poverty and come up with products and services appropriate for that. I think we're well on the way to um, at least articulating answers to that question. But I think there are other things that we're far from having resolved. I think um, one of the biggest issues is going to be what is meant by political corporate responsibility, PCR. It's a very hot topic now. And um, on the one hand, every corporation is political just by virtue of its charter. If you look back at the history of corporations, um, even a university was a corporation and they all had to swear they came for the benefit of some kind of public good. But they had to specify very precisely what that good or service was. Now we have people claiming that corporations should involve themselves in all sorts of matters that corporations have historically been loath to do. And, and I am, um, I'm a little bit worried about this. I think some of my colleagues are naive about the history of colonialism. Let's not forget the East India Company was a corporation. Let's not forget that many corporations were heavily involved in the exploitation of Africa. So to just hope um, that corporations are gonna have goodwill um, and are always going to be on the right ethical side of things, I think is naive. I think that the Yale Corporate Governance Project, um, headed by Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, when they pressured companies to come out and say that they would withdraw from Russia, that was an extremely powerful statement that was made. Many companies fell in line, but um, you could see that the corporations were really out ahead of even where the federal government was. And it began to feel to me and some of my colleagues as though the corporations were making foreign policy, not the government. And um, I think we have to think, what do we mean by political in the first place? Yeah, I just wrote a paper. In Aristotle, there are at least four different senses of the term political. You go to you know, a feminist, you're gonna get a def different definition. You go to a Confucian, you're gonna get a different definition. So, what do we mean by political? That would be one thing that would have to be defined, I think, rather carefully. And then after you define it, what are the limitations and the capabilities of um, political action by corporations? In other words, where do they have authority and where don't they have authority? And I think the jury is far from coming back with a verdict on that. And I think um, the analytical work on that, the analytical work that needs to be done on that topic has not even really been started.